To The Point with Michael Williams. From affordable care to a budget for dreamers, President Trump trying to change what Democrats have done. Good morning and welcome. When members of Congress return this coming week to Washington, they'll be facing a series of issues, including a budget with tax cuts that could also greatly increase the national debt. How will they handle that and much more? Joining me now to discuss that, local Democrat, a familiar face, U.S. Representative Lois Frankel, whose district stretches from Boca Raton up to Riviera Beach. Our Democratic Congresswoman joins us, of course, also familiar as former West Palm Beach mayor. So we thank you for being with us. Plenty to talk about today. Thanks, as always, for being our guest. Let's talk about the budget. $4 trillion budget passed. The Senate really passed that budget, using it as a template for huge tax cut proposals that the Republican-led Congress, at the behest of President Trump, wants to enact. Your take. Well, first of all, Michael, always great to be with you. Pleasure to have Incidentally, you. Incidentally, the House passed the budget last week, very quietly, mm -hmm. which cut Medicare and Medicaid drastically, affecting a lot of people. The Republican-led House. The Republican, yeah, all Democrats voted against it. This, this is sort of a ruse, it's this whole budget plan, and basically to give the richest Americans tax cuts. We haven't seen the details, and what worries me, uh, the, the plan that the Senate has uh, increases, it's not that it just increases a deficit by a trillion and a half dollars. What worries- Over 10 years. Over 10 years. What worries me, I believe, is going to be the cuts that they will eventually try to take in order to justify that. And that means Medicare and Medicaid, that, that's what's at stake. Already been talked about some Republicans, their long-term goal, turning Medicare into more, more of a voucher-type program. It's not a new concept, but it's bubbling up yet again. Those are the kind of things well, that have you worried. That's what was in the House budget sure. last week. Yeah. They actually made Medicare into a voucher program. And then Medicaid, uh, the ongoing concerns, an effort to try and turn that into block grants. Now, supporters of that will say, listen, because of a burgeoning national debt, 20 trillion and climbing, we need to do these kind of things because Medicare is not sustainable on its current course, nor Medicaid. So how would you answer that kind of Republican response? Well, first of all, we, sh we, we should not be giving tax breaks to the very rich on the backs of people needing medical care. Half the births in this country are paid for by Medicaid. Almost everyone who is in a nursing home, that, that's paid for by Medicaid. And our senior citizens, that's their health care is Medicare. So I say absolutely, we cannot hurt those programs. We want to talk about the Affordable Care Act. The president mm -hmm. has gone back and forth on cutting subsidies to insurers that allowed those insurers to reduce the cost for low-income participants in the Affordable Care Act. That is still a matter of debate with Lamar Alexander and Senator Patty Murphy, Democrat from right. Washington, try to come up with a bipartisan compromise to restore the money. Where do we stand right now on cutting subsidies that could have a direct impact on some of your constituents if they can no longer to afford, uh, be able to afford the premiums for the Affordable Care Act policies? Well, let's just start with the basic premise that I think most Americans agree on, is that if it, you should be able to take your child to the doctor or buy medicine or be able to respond to a, an illness without going into bankruptcy. The Affordable Care Act gave access to health care to 20 million more Americans than before without being penalized for pre-existing conditions or a lot of other benefits to it. Uh, the president was unable to get a what we call a, a repeal and replace bill because it's very difficult. People don't want to give up a lot of the things they have now. So the president's become what I call, Michael, he's become a one-man wrecking ball to try to decimate the Affordable Care Act. This cost-sharing sh uh, plan of his or, or taking it away is just one of so many things that they've been doing. They, they're, they're cutting off the advertising of the program. They're shortening how you can get into the program. They've cut off the funding for the navigators. Uh, they're allowing the sale of junk insurance. And what this means to most of us, we're going to see premiums rise. Do you think the compromise will be able to get through Congress to at least temporarily restore subsidies to make these policies more affordable for low-income participants? Or is well, that still a big question mark right well, now? Well, you're sort of asking me to, to uh, sort of... Uh, what, <laughs> crystal ball is what crystal I'm asking ball. you to have. Here's what I think. I think possibly towards the end of the year, maybe it will be in a budget mm -hmm. deal. How many of your constituents would be impacted by these ongoing cuts? When you look at a rough gauge in your district, of people, well, real, real faces here. 
I'm not sure uh, the district, but I would say in Florida, mm -hmm. at least 65,000 people would be directly minimal. Minimal by ju just that one piece that the president done. But if it, you if you take everything uh, that he's trying to do, you know, Florida has the most people in the Affordable Care Act. So we're talking about not only uh, millions of people around the world, around the country that would lose mm -hmm. their health insurance. The million plus in Florida. But, but the premium is going up for everybody else. One of the items we'll continue to look at, one of the hot spots issues wise, and certainly a big impact for so many pocketbooks, depending on the way it goes. I want to turn to foreign affairs for a moment. Yes, you sit on well. the foreign affairs committee. You visited South Korea. Talk about tensions between South Korea and North Korea. The president's ongoing rhetoric, calling Kim Jong-un rocket man, hinting, <laughs> hinting a few weeks ago, meeting with military leaders at the White House that, uh, you know, could be the quiet before the storm. Where do we stand in terms of the potential for a miscalculation and military action involving North Korea? Well, Michael, people are scared. I'm going to tell you an interesting story. Yesterday, I went to a middle school. I spoke to a class. It was a, a room of 500 students. And they actually asked me a question about North Korea, believe it or not. I asked them, how many of you are worried about uh, what's going on in North Korea? Everybody in that room raised their hand. These are kids. You know what? It reminded me uh, back during the Bay of Pigs uh, mm -hmm. when, we were, when we were so afraid of a nuclear war. I am very concerned about our president's rhetoric. I am concerned about his temperament. Uh, when a, I've said this before on your show. A preemptive military strike on our part on North Korea would be devastating. You would see the loss of millions of lives in South Korea, perhaps uh, Japan, that includes hundreds of thousands of American lives, our military personnel, and probably without any really any gain. Uh, so I would say we've got to keep going down the diplomatic alley there. It would be nice. It would be nice if we actually had an ambassador mm -hmm. to South Korea. Uh, if you look at the State Department, it's been decimated in personnel. So we've got to really ramp up what's going on in the State Department and, and stay on the diplomatic track. When it comes to immigration, do Democrats have the ability to stop uh, the Republican-led plan to build that wall along the Mexican border? Even some Republicans say there are more high-tech ways to do it at less cost than building a wall that by some estimates 10, 12, 14 billion dollars, depending on who you talk to. Do, can Democrats really stop that? Well, I think, uh, you know, the, uh, the wall is sort of, of uh, is a folly. It's, a, it's Trump's folly. It's billions of dollars, and you don't really get too much. Uh, actually, you know, more people actually uh, go into Mexico today. <laughs> they go into Mexico, they come from Mexico here. The quick Republican rejoinder, which I want <laughs> you to respond to as part of your answer, will be that yeah. when they hear that, they say, but you're not tough enough on border security. So, Well, here's what I think. I'm, I'm not against border security. I do think we need... Uh, immigration reform. It's a big picture, though. We have to take, not only is border security part of it, not necessarily a wall, uh, you have to have a rule of law. You have to have an orderly uh, immigration system. Uh, but you know, also, we have to deal with the 11 million plus undocumented uh, people who are here and figure out those who are here who are law abiding, they're not uh, felons. You know, if you're Paying felons, taxes. You, we want them to pay taxes. Uh, we want them, I want them to have a path to citizenship, and we have to obviously more immediately take care of our dreamers, these young people who are here because their parents brought them here. They really had no choice, and they know no other, no other home. Do you believe at the end that Congress can create a fix that allows dreamers who came here, not their choice, they came with their parents when they were young, President Trump kicked the ball to Congress, will dreamers have a chance? And will there be a bill fashion that will allow them to find a path to stay here in the U.S. in your mind? Wait. And again, I know I'm asking you all day, it's like, where's my crystal okay. ball? But what's your sense okay, well, right here's now? Here's the thing. You asked me, can we? Of course we can. Will we? But will we? You know, this is such an unpredictable Congress, I'm sorry to say. I know there are a lot of us who will be trying to make it happen. And there have been uh, bipartisan overtones to yes. that conversation. But as you sit here today, even given that, will we is still a very open question, whether dreamers right. will get protections that allow them to stay. If a bill came to the floor, today, I think we could, we could pass it, but you, the leadership has to be willing to do that. Need to turn to the Vegas shooting. Uh, that, oh. that so traumatized this nation. There's been talk in Congress about possibly 
banning the oh. bump stocks that allowed rapid-fire semi-automatics to, in effect, become an automatic weapon for the killer. And at first, the National Rifle Association very much seemed on board. What is the sense on what we may see, at least in that limited piece of legislation on bump stocks in Congress? Well, this is a bad day for my, my answers to your questions, Michael, because I'm going to tell you, I don't see any hope for this Congress doing anything. Listen, even we, that, even that we couldn't even get the uh, the expansion of the uh, licensing uh, the background checks, which 80 percent of Americans uh, approve of. We couldn't even get that. You know what this Congress is good at when it comes to gun safety and so forth? Whenever we have a tragedy, we have a moment of silence in the chamber. We bow our head for about a minute, then we go on. So I say this, this uh, Congress, no, don't hold your breath. It seems it's setting up a clear demarcation on issues, though, for 2018. Mm -hmm. And so if the 2018 election was tomorrow, what would be your Democratic message to voters out there? Obviously, we'll be sitting with Republican yeah. Congress people here in the weeks to come, and we do as we balance our coverage. But from a Democratic seat, what's your right. message going to be? Well, I think, you know, I think, uh, of course, a lot of us are resisting a lot of what we call the ridiculousness uh, and the dangerousness of the Trump administration. But our message has to be much more than, than that, because there are still people who are hurting this country. They're living paycheck to paycheck or social, on their Social Security. Our message is one of let's get better wages, get better uh, better jobs, invest in education, in infrastructure, in biomedical research, and let's try to get some of the basic costs of things that people rely on every day, like how about child care, which now is almost costing the cost of college. How about getting the cost of college so people can afford it? And for our seniors especially, trying to go after lowering the cost of medication. So I think that uh, I mean, we have a lot to talk about, but I think the, the Democratic message has to be an economic message. I have to ask you, as a, a mom of a military vet, son yeah. of the Marine Corps, served in Afghanistan, there's been such a hue and cry over the last week uh -huh. or so, when in essence President Trump said at one point he'd done as much or more than many other presidents in recent history in terms of outreach mm -hmm. to families of right. those fallen. Uh, as a congresswoman, as a mom with a son, you've talked uh, very proudly about his service. Right. Your, your take on that whole debate. Look, my focus is on the family. I, I, I could, I could tell you, I, you know, this uh, recent Green Beret, uh, S Sergeant Johnson, left a pregnant wife, two young children, a mother and father. They were in mourning, mm -hmm. and really, my thoughts are with them. And quite frankly, I will tell you, I think I heard another uh, a family talk about whether the president called me or not. I probably wouldn't care because I think the loss is so mm -hmm. great, and I really think that this debate has gone off and it's, mm -hmm. the president always makes it about himself you know my advice to him would be is look whatever you said if if you somehow insulted a, a family you didn't mean to insult the family whatever you know what they're in mourning so just say look i feel sorry for your pain i i thank your son for his service and if i said anything to hurt you i apologize and just let me know and let you know how grateful our country is Congresswoman, many topics to discuss, many more we could get to. Wish we had more time, but we know we can have you back And uh, as you zip back and forth to Washington. Yes. But thanks, as always, for taking time to speak to us and therefore your constituents here in South Florida. Always a pleasure, Michael. Thank you, Congresswoman. Coming up, an expert on Lake Okeechobee tells us whether we should be concerned about the high water levels in the lake. He'll take a long-term view as well.